uh, National Reconnaissance Office I have from the uh, early 90s, it, it lists specifically magic, M-A-J-I-C, and uh, cosmic ops, and um, uh, various code numbers and code names on this document. And um, uh, we know it's a legitimate document. And, and, right. and so um, it, it was basically warning of a security breach at the Nellis Air Force Range out at uh, Pahoot Mesa S-12, S-4, S-3, Room Lake, um, where a lot of very classified uh, research and development and aerospace activities take place related to all of this. Um, I mean, the public has has incorrectly called it in Area 51, but nobody calls it that, um, who's in the know. Um, but uh, the point being <clears throat> that this this is um, this document actually is, has that distribu- on the distribution for this alert for a security breach out at that range, and MAGIC was one of them. So. Right. You know, one of the other more interesting meetings that we had in the Pentagon was with the director of the uh, Defense Intelligence Agency. And uh, we didn't think we were going to get that, put that meeting together until we, uh, we got some briefing material uh, hand-delivered to the director, and suddenly I received a call and said, look, not only do we want to meet with you, we'd like to expedite the meeting. So... Uh, we, we, uh, you and I uh, uh, went up to the Pentagon and, and met with uh, the director, and I think it was two of his staff members. Right. And you know, it, it, he again, he received the briefing material that we had with not only great interest, but also uh, shared some uh, some some personal information that I won't go into now, uh, showing that he had a, a, a great personal interest in the subject, as well as a professional interest. But as head of DIA, he had asked his staff, uh, his uh, many minions and other related agencies, if he could get some background material on the subject of UFOs and extraterrestrial intelligence. And he said, as he got up from his desk, he said, and gentlemen, this is the only thing that I received. And he walked over to a bookshelf and he Took down a little model of uh, you know a tiny little alien uh, uh, play figure, right? An ET e. doll, sort of. An ET e. doll, yeah, that right, that was right. it. And uh, <laughs> you know, it was it was kind of sad. Once again, you know, we explained to him that you know in his position he would be protected from the knowledge of the subject. Right. That didn't go over very well, I might add. Uh, we, but, and I do remember, it. yeah, and I do remember uh, us commenting that you know because I, I I have a couple of, of disclosure project sources who have uh, been tasked with this issue, and particularly has, have seen some of the uh, images taken by some of our satellites uh, or birds that we have up there of these objects, and so certainly there are people in that command, even though this he was a three-star general, I believe, um, was not being uh, given the information, but there are compartmented operations at DIE that in fact do deal with this subject, but they just weren't telling him, and I remember when when we made the point that there were certainly operations that we knew about that I had talked to people about that had dealt with this issue at the Defense Intelligence Agency at the Pentagon, uh, but that there, there were people in his command who who just weren't uh, letting him uh, know about it. There was a, a visible stiffening of the body language of the colonel who was at the table. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I, I remember that he was sitting over taking notes in in the back corner. Uh, yeah, I, I would say he was not amused at that revelation. No. Uh, through a, a uh, former um, NSA contact of mine, I had the chance to meet with a high-level retired uh, National Security Agency uh, senior civilian. And this gentleman, we, we talked about the subject of, uh, of, of UFOs and, again, whether any government agency either had information on the subject or had interest in. And he revealed one one tidbit of information I found very interesting. He said within, uh, within NSA, there was a document known only as the document, and it was on the subject of UFOs and extraterrestrial intelligence. And it was so highly classified that only the director himself and perhaps one or two other people were actually able to view it. Its existence was widely known, 
but uh, again, very, very close hold uh, information. Right. So right. extremely. Yeah. Well, and what's interesting is that you know when when Jimmy Carter was during the transition from the election into when he took office, he he uh, they always have a, a meeting with the uh, incoming president and the current and perhaps outgoing director of the CIA, who at that time was George H. W. Bush uh, Bush Senior, and uh, Carter uh, wanted to be briefed on this, and and Bush told him, um, well. Um, I am not going to tell you anything about this. And this is when Carter tried to set up the, the White House uh, study group uh, right. on the issue, and, and that was eventually <clears throat> shut down. And um, uh, one of Carter's friends, uh, Jimmy Carter's friends, in fact, I, we just saw uh, <clears throat> Jimmy Carter, uh, you know, at the inauguration uh, last week or two weeks ago, and, and he um, he was uh, at this time he was in Spain. Uh, signing guitars uh, from a guitar classical guitar factory with this classical guitarist who's a supporter of the Disclosure Project, and uh, they were auctioning them off with his signature or, or autograph from the president to raise money for the Carter Center there in Atlanta. And uh, this, <laughs> afterwards, there were about 20 people at dinner, and the president was there, and, and someone said, you know, what was it like being the most powerful man in the world? And President Carter said, well, I don't think I was that man. I, there were things that uh, I didn't have access to that I knew existed and knew were going on. And, and, and someone said, oh, really? Things like what? UFOs and with a sort of a chuckle, sort of a derision, sort of a ridiculing laugh. And uh, Carter stopped them and said, yes, that and more. Yeah. And you could have heard a pin drop in the room, according to uh, my friend who was there, um, uh, because people at first thought, surely the guy must be joking. He was not joking. And this is, of course, what we found uh, with uh, President Clinton, that you know, when H Webster Hubble, who was third in command at Justice, was tasked by the president to look into uh, – well, he was asked by the president. This is in his book. You can read it, uh, Friends in High Places, where he was asked by Clinton to look into two things. Number one – who really killed Jack Kennedy? And number two, what is this going on with UFOs? What are they and what's happening? Right. And Webster Hubble basically came back and said, uh, well, in the book he says, we were not happy with the answers. Uh, to people on my team, he said very directly, we knew we were being lied to and that we're not idiots. But they never got any answers. And, and, and actually, this is, you know, I didn't know all that. I mean, you can imagine, here I am, I'm a 35-year-old guy or whatever it is, briefing a CIA director and trying to put together this best available evidence packet for the President of the United States. I mean, you know, I'm working as an emergency doctor with four daughters and a golden retriever and a house. Right. You know, and and it, I'm a little uh, – well, first of all, I have to say I was very skeptical when my point of contact uh, to the CIA director sent me a FedEx saying, you will be the first person to brief – the Clinton administration and the CIA director on this subject, and I just laughed. My wife and I looked at each other and said, what, baloney? Um, and I thought that I was being asked up there just to share what, what, what I knew because they wanted to pick my brain like you know spies like to do. But when we had the dinner and we had the discussion, it was clearly evident that the CIA director did not know and was being denied access, and he was very upset about it and very mad about it, and that um, this was something that was a complete breakdown in the constitutional and legal chain of command oversight, uh, which is exactly what, going back you know, 50 years, as Eisenhower was talking about in 1961 during his farewell address to the nation. And so, you know, you kind of go full circle, and, and you know, it's, nothing changes, it seems. But uh, and actually, that was the impetus. I have to give people a little perspective between. Uh, 92 or 3 and 2001, uh, we did our best uh, with the help of many people, but including, and, uh, and and as one of the stars of this effort is Commander Miller here, who's, who's on this radio show with me today, to, to brief the correct people in the Congress. I met with a number of chairmen of committees, members of Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, members of the, you know, all the ranks, foreign as well as domestic at that level. Um, to encourage them to take the issue, investigate it, disclose the information, pave the way for peaceful contact with these civilizations, but also to pave the way for uh, the useful 
uh, energy generation technologies that had been studied and developed over over the last 50 or 60 years to come out to benefit humanity. And, and what I found, I thought, now here was how naive I was when I was 35. I thought that if we provided this positive evidence, proof, documents, testimony, photographs, that these people would then be able to just do it. Um, but that's not the case. Knowledge does not mean access. And exactly. this, it took me a long time to realize someone may know about the subject after we provide. They may even have project code names and code numbers that I can get to them. But that doesn't mean that that official or that president or that senator or whoever actually is going to be given access and control over that compartment and operation. Those are two separate things. And I remember a couple, you know, remember, well, a couple years ago, we had a, a delegation come over from France. Yes, and uh, these were actually quite high-level people, and and one of them was very involved in putting together stuff for the French intelligence and Air Force and and for their president, and um, it, it was kind of shocking to them to realize that we, you and I had had these kinds of meetings over the years with people of that rank, admirals, generals, CIA directors, and that they didn't honestly know anything, and they weren't controlling these projects. And then I remember having to explain to one of them, look. We lose every year in our intelligence and, and Department of Defense and other related budgets, which is now approximately going up towards a trillion a year, if you add them all together, Homeland Security, all that. Then we lose each year somewhere in the 100 to $200 billion that go into these compartments where no one knows where they're going more than you or any other country in the world spends each year. So we we kind of don't even know where that amount is going. That would equal the largest defense budget in the world uh, if you were to look at the world uh, totally. I mean, it includes China, Russia, and all of the countries in, in, in the EU. Yeah. So this was – it was kind of an eye-opening but very disturbing uh, – experience for them, I learned. And, and access of potentially misused riches, you know. Yeah, but once again, you know, this this money uh, doesn't uh, fall like manna. It's taxpayer dollars, taxpayer right. dollars at work on projects that, uh, that could potentially benefit mankind. Right. And there's the issue of, of technology transfer, you know. Uh, over the years, I have come to believe that there is some of that technology in use uh, by Department of Defense. Oh, yes. Uh, I, I'll give a couple of examples. Uh, I have uh, I, I had a friend, a, a former military officer who, who worked with me, and this fellow was pretty unique. He was on track to be a NASA astronaut, and uh, then he had that uh, greatest misfortune of all misfortunes as a test pilot to have more takeoffs than landings. You always want those two numbers to equal out. Right. And un unfortunately, he was in a couple of really bad crashes, no fault of his own equipment failures. And last one nearly killed him, so it, it also killed his chances of being an astronaut. But as fate would have it, they gave him another high-level position, and that was to go out to the, the famous Groom Lake facility, Area 51. And he was out there for several years. Right. Now, as as we all know, most folks that work out there have sign their lives away never to disclose what goes on and uh, for better or for worse and this fellow was no different and over the three years I, I worked with him and he knew my interest in things extraterrestrial and my work with CSETI never once did he mention any of his work out at Groom Lake or any association between that and anything extraterrestrial and uh, the day I was leaving the command, he took me aside. He said, you know, Will, uh, some of the folks you talk with, maybe some CSETI uh, researchers, may see objects that are doing, you know, Mach 9 and then suddenly make a right-angle turn. And you say, well, gosh, that's got to be an extraterrestrial craft. And then he looked at me and said, but it's not. And he just turned and walked away. Correct. So... You know, that coupled with a couple of other uh, incidences, one of which was a, another fellow who'd been out at Groom Lake who, when I was leaving that command, said, bye, you know, have uh, enjoy your next assignment. And, uh, you know, 5461, 
And I said, excuse me, what, what was that number, uh, Bob? He says, uh, 5461. So it doesn't mean anything to me. He says, that's the number of the program you were interested in. Right. And of